Hello, everybody. Warm greetings to, to everyone. Welcome back, a very warm welcome back to this session. To those who just uh, finished the, the early one and also to those who are just joining us for, for this session. Uh, where in which we will learn about changing landscapes in world Christianity. And I think we are now really accelerating the, the, the flow of, of this uh, of this seminar sessions uh, of three days. Um, my name is Risto Jukko and I work as the director of the World Cosmos Church's Commission on World Mission and Evangelism in Geneva. In this plenary, we will have three extremely inspiring and, and, and challenging presentations of the world Christianity in, in view of, of changing landscapes in world Christianity to be more precise. Each of our three distinguished keynote speakers will have something like 20 minutes, you know now the rules already, and, and we will li listen to them first, uh, no really break in between, and then we will open the floor for your questions, comments, uh, and, and, and eventually a discussion if you have time. And uh, the time is, is short, I know it's only 90 minutes altogether, starting from now on, very, very sharp. Um, I just remind you that uh, to, to ask questions, you, you, need, you need to use the Zoom function uh, in your, in your, in your, um, on your computer in the screen. And, uh, and then uh, you may also, of course, address either a specific speaker or all three of them. It's up to you to, 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 to decide. Please be concise. And uh, when you are giving your questions, and in any case, in case of any, possible technical uh, problem, please please send a chat to our technical support in the and via the chat box function. Thank you. Our first distinguished speaker is Reverend Professor Dr. J. Kwapena Asamoakiadu, who is Bioethical Professor of African Christianity and Pentecostal Theology and the President of the Trinity Theological Seminary in Legon, Accra, in Ghana. Professor Guapena has served as visiting scholar to Harvard University, Luther Seminary, Overseas Ministry Study Centers in New Haven. He has also been a visiting professor to Asbury Theological Seminary in Kentucky, USA, all this USA, and Yonsei International University in Songdo, South Korea. He's member of the Lausanne Theology Working Group and is author of African Charismatics, Contemporary Pentecostal Christianity. Size and Science of the Spirit, and uh, co-editor with Frieda Ludwig of African Christian Presence in the West. He's lead editor of Between Babel and Pentecost, Migrant Readings from Africa, uh, Europe, and Asia. And he has also recently published uh, in 2020 uh, a book uh, titled Christianity and Faith in the COVID-19 Era, Lockdown Periods from Hosanna to Pentecost. He has written many other articles in international journals relating to Christianity as a non-Western religion. Uh, today, the title of his presentation is The Spirit Moved, Africa in the Changing Landscapes, in the Changing Contours of World Christianity. This sounds extremely exciting and we are really looking forward to it. Professor Asamu Akiyari, please over to you. My topic for you this afternoon is the I chose the um, uh, major mm. title. Is yes, please. The Spirit Moveth, Africa in the Changing Contours of World Christianity. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to first say that the emergence of the of of the discipline that we call world christianity as you know has occurred against the backdrop of several developments uh, especially from the 20th century uh, the first one that i have listed there is the challenge of western christianity as normative in terms of what we describe as Christianity in the world today. And this is something that we have lived with 
um, since the early missionary era, Western missionary era. Um, I recall that uh, as a Ghanaian growing up in my own country, the Presbyterian church, for example, was simply called Basel. Um, so if you ask the average Ghanaian in those days what church they attended, if they were Presbyterian, they would say Basel. Um, so then the, 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 the geographical location from where the Presbyterian church came into Ghana became the name of the, of the denomination. It tells you how much our understanding of Christianity was framed by, by the context from which the missionaries came. Um, now more and more we say Presbyterian, but in those days it was simply Basel. So that's the first one. The second is the decline of Christian presence in the West, that is the former heartlands of the faith. Um, the third um, is that by the middle of the 20th century, we know that uh, Christianity had gradually become a non-Western or non-white religion. And then um, the fourth is the evidence that Christianity was now being appropriated, understood, received um, through the cultures, customs, and traditions outside the European Enlightenment frame. This is something that Lamin Sane talks about in his book, Translating the Message. And then fifthly, uh, migration. Um, those of you who are familiar with the work of Jehu Hansels would know his very monumental work, Beyond Christendom where the intersection between Christianity and migration is discussed. So these are some of the factors that has changed, if you like, our understanding of world Christianity. And I have a, a quotation there from Thomas Tangara, if you like to underscore the point I'm trying to make. By calling it world or global Christianity, we have removed all possible limits, the scope and extent of Christian community. Yet the scope of Christian community has always been under pressure with the question of who is in and who is out. And by the desire, and by the desire to make a particular form of Christianity as the benchmark, at every such occasion, the Christian community has voted on the side of opening up the expanse of Christianity. Therefore, the term word Christianity stands as a constant reminder to the inclusive character of Christianity, highlighting its Catholicity. So when we talk about world Christianity, I think the first thing that will come to mind is the Catholicity of the faith. And what I seek to do is to make the point that this Catholicity must be understood in a Trinitarian way. What do I mean by understanding world Christianity in Trinitarian terms? First, that God as Father cannot be domesticated. And we learn from Acts 17, 24, um, how God made the world and everything in it, and how Paul says that um, this God, the God of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. And if I expand the meaning of shrine to mean a Christian context, whether Western or non-Western, a God cannot be domesticated. The second is the fact of the incarnation, the mere fact that God in Christ identified with humanity not with Methodists or Presbyterians or Catholics or Europeans or Asians or whatever, is also a sign of this Catholicity. And Paul, I think, summarizes as well in Galatians um, 3, 26 and 28, where he talks about for God, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There is no longer Jew or Greek and so on and so forth. And then the third is God, the Holy Spirit, who pours out himself on all flesh. So denominationalism and race-specific and language and ethnic-based Christian communities are human constructs. That's the point I want to make. 
that if we understand world Christianity from a Trinitarian perspective, then any Christianity that is denomination specific, race specific, language specific, or ethnic specific must be seen as a human construct. It is not a God construct. So we need to talk about world Christianity from the perspective of Christian, the Christian theology of revelation. That is the personal self-disclosure of God within history, which reaches at climax in Jesus of Nazareth as the incarnate word of God. And the emergence of world Christianity, at least from a Christian perspective, must necessarily begin with the incarnation, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and we beholding his glory as the glory of, of the father's only son. So my point, if you look at the last bullet point on that screen is that the incarnation introduces into the equation, the work of the spirit, because the answer that Mary was given when she asks, how shall this be? After she had been told that she was going to be the bearer of God. The answer she received was the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So what this means is that um, the Holy Spirit um, help, helps us to define um, world Christianity in an inclusive way. So um, I'm quoting Cabrita, Joel Cabrita and David Maxwell here. Instead of being seen as peripheral to the main narrative of the Christian faith, the shift to world Christianity has allowed scholars to view Christianity in Africa, Asia, the Pacific and Latin America as stories with their own integrity and their own centers of gravity. And that's where um, Africa, uh, comes into the equation. Um, so Africa comes into the equation because one, in the representative list of nations at Pentecost, Africa is listed. And then you know the story of how in the post-Pentecost period, in the immediate post-Pentecost period, Philip is called to uh, minister to this Ethiopian Enoch. The church fathers, have also played their role in the making of theology. And when I say church fathers, I mean the African church fathers, Augustine and so on and so forth. And then Christian religious innovation in Africa, which I'll come to in a moment. And then um, the church in Africa and the African diaspora, and then Christian scholarship in Africa, and then finally Christianity in Africa and institutions of higher learning. These are the uh, benchmarks that I use in determining how Africa has become um, um, a central player in world Christianity. So I begin from church history. Augustine's major contribution to Christianity lies in the development of theology as an academic discipline. In other words, in talking about world Christianity, you cannot talk about Christian theology without the involvement of Africa. Augustine's major contributions, the doctrine of the church and sacraments, the doctrine of grace, the doctrine of the Trinity. And I quote McGrath there to support the point I'm trying to make. The second I want to focus on is Christian religious innovation, Ethiopianist movement, um, the Ethiopianist churches um, that sought to break the Western missionary hegemonical influence on the African church. And I like to quote my late senior colleague Obukalu from his book, African Pentecostalism. He says, the movement dubbed Ethiopianism challenged white representation of African values, cultures, and the practice of the Christian faith. It challenged white monopoly over the cultic and decision-making powers within the church and the monopoly of the interpretation of the canon and the cultural symbols of worship. So today, the Bible has become 
a very African document in the way we interpret it. And I like to give the example of how in 1888, David Vincent Brown and um, a Baptist minister seceded from the Baptist church in Nigeria to form the native Baptist church and change his name to Mojola Agbewi as a symbolic protest to what I'm describing as Western Christian hegemony. So by the end of the 19th century already, uh, Christianity was becoming African through this Ethiopianist movement. Christian religious innovation in Africa continued with the rise of the prophetic movements by the early 20th century. Prophets like William, William Wadi Harris, Garek Sokari Braid of the Niger Delta, Simon Kimbangu of the DR, um, of the DR Congo, and Azar Shembe of South Africa. These prophetic movements um, gave further impetus to the emergence of Christianity as a very African concern and the rise of a new way of looking at Christianity as an African religion. So my point here is that the teaching of African Christianity in terms of mission history and ecclesiology would be better set with the integration of prophetism as part of the curriculum. Because the rise of independent prophetic movement has continued all through the 20th century. And even the rise of the contemporary uh, indigenous Pentecostalism has prophetism at the center. At this point in time, I don't see how we can teach Christianity in Africa as part of world Christianity without um, a key, uh, uh, without a, a keen emphasis on the independent uh, prophetic movement of the early 20th century that led many people away from the uh, Western mission churches or historic mission denominations as I refer to them um, to form new independent churches. And that's my third point. The prophetic movements led to the rise of what came to be known as the African independent church movement. And now at the end of the 20th century, we have um, the contemporary um, Pentecostals. This is, uh, if you look at my third, my third bullet point, this is the late Kalu on, on and how we situate African religions, religious innovation, in the study of global Pentecostalism. He says, in the interpretation of global Pentecostalism, the historical discourse argues the necessity for appreciating the context and periods from whence the movement fled up. It argues that the stories of various revitalization movements within said context provide the backdrop to the contemporary manifestation of Pentecostalism. In other words, even in the study of Pentecostalism, we got to highlight the African contribution right from the, from the start of the independent church. I brought this um, image for you to see the rise of the new Pentecostal in Africa. And I like us to pay attention, not just to the crowd, but also the demographics. If you want to see the future of Christianity in Africa, pay attention to how young um, the, 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 the movement it, in terms of the people who are joining uh, contemporary Pentecostalism. Not just that, but even the area of higher education. High school education, its contribution to the training of personnel for the public service in Africa started from the early 20th century. And we cannot discuss world Christianity without the involvement of the church in Africa in higher education. Today, we also have the establishment of universities by historic mission denominations and the establishment of universities by Pentecostals or in Africa and both in Ghana and Nigeria. Some of the best universities are established by, by African churches. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is perhaps 
the single most important indicator of the ecumenical nature of the people of God as a community of faith whose identity is defined by their common allegiance to Christ. And that's why I started with looking at world Christianity in Trinitarian perspective in order that it will be inclusive. Now, how does Pentecost define the place of Africa in world Christianity? In the first place, the spirit of God is poured out on all, all flesh. And secondly, as I noted at the beginning, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene in Africa um, are also listed. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. So when we are talking about world Christianity, it is not something into which we introduce Africa in the middle. The history must be taught with Africa as part of it from the beginning and not a Western Christianity which Africa adopted along the line. Let's also pay attention to Africans in our contemporary times who have made their contribution to African Christianity. I'm surprised that I go to seminaries in Africa and I don't find any significant emphasis on the study of personalities, African personalities who have contributed to modern African theology. I'm talking about names like Mbiti, Laminsane, Kwambe Diaku, John Pobi, Ama Odioye, Musa Dube, Obukalu, Teresa Okure, Musibi Kanyoro, Kwesi Dixon, and so on. Um, I think that we must very deliberately let the seminaries and institutions in Africa focus on these personalities and their contribution to world Christianity as Africans. My conclusion, since I have just 20 minutes. First, the attempt to respond to theological colonization through the development of African theology has been a useful journey as far as Africa's place in world Christianity is concerned. One does not, however, get the impression that Africa's theological institutions have been willing to mainstream African theological ideas in their curricula and systems of formation. And that I think must change. Third, independent indigenous Pentecostal charismatic theology has still not found its way into the syllabus as a core subject, whether in mission studies, systematic theology, or even in church history. And then finally, if Christianity has become a non-Western religion, then this shift must be reflected in teaching world Christianity within the current ecumenical context. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Kwabena. This was very, very, very illustrating uh, and, and very descriptive uh, analysis of what is happening in Africa for those of us who may not be maybe so well informed. Of course, this notion of, of uh, non-white religion uh, is reminded to the, uh, to the Westerners so through the migration, as you, as you say, and, th and this aspect of Trinitarian theology is, was also very, very interesting, which also comes to the question you 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 were dealing very well the question of Pentecostalism in, and prophetism as 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 African especially African phenomena. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, I think there will be many questions to you, uh, but they will be they will be asked after after our third speaker. But before that, we have our second distinguished speaker. Uh, our our next distinguished speaker is uh, Professor Filomena Vaura. She's associate professor in the philosophy and uh, religious studies department and the former director center for gender equity, equity and empowerment at Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya. She's also former president of the International Association of Mission Studies, uh, the African region coordinator of the Theological Commission and uh, uh, of the Women's Commission of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians and a member of the Circle of uh, Concerned African Women Theologians. She has published extensively on various aspects of African Christianity, uh, new religious movements and gender and theology. 
some of her later publications are, for instance, Spiritual Warfare and Healing in Kenyan Pentecostalism, or uh, and uh, Pentecostalism, Pentecostalism, Catholicism, and the Spirit in the in the world. Uh, and African Pentecostalism and, and World Christianity. Uh, Professor Maura will speak to us of a mission, plurality, mission and plurality of Christian expressions in East Africa. Uh, Professor Maura, we are highly honored by your contribution and it is now your turn to inspire and, and challenge us. Please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that introduction. And I also want to thank the World Council of Churches and the organizers of this uh, conference for inviting me to speak and to participate in this conference. Uh, I want also to say that I agree with all that uh, Professor Kwabena has said. Uh, some of the things that he has said, uh, I have also reflected in my paper, but I will omit them. So uh, I'll read what I have written and hope that I will finish within good time. Uh, over the past several decades, the phrase world Christianity has gained popularity as a way of talking about the contemporary global configurations of the Christian religion in all its complexities. It is a concept that designates a discipline that goes beyond ecumenical and missiological discourses. The study of world Christianity investigates and seeks to understand Christian communities, faith and practice as they are found on the six continents, expressed in diverse ecclesial traditions and informed by the multitude of historical and cultural experiences in a world that for good or ill is rapidly globalizing. It is concerned with both the diversity of the local or indigenous expressions of the Christian life and faith throughout the world and the variety of ways these interact with one another critically and constructively across time and space. Apparently, it is particularly concerned with the marginalized and underrepresented communities of faith resulting in a greater degree of attention being paid to Africa, Latin America, and Oceania experiences. This shift in ways of studying world Christianity has seen greater attention being given to how local communities have received and transformed the imported Christianities, the role of popular religiosity like the African instituted churches, and the presence of the new Pentecostal churches. Today, there is a proliferation of a body of research on Christianity's global history, and the awareness is growing too that Christianity was never the exclusive possession of the Western world, and certainly it is not today. Nevertheless, questions still abound on how the changes in world to Christianity's geography <clears throat> impact, theology, impact theology, mission, and ministry. In this paper, the dialectic relationship between diversity or pluralism and unity within world Christianity is explored and its implications for mission within the East African context. And then finally, I will look at how ecumenism is taught uh, in, in the, the, Afri the East African context. So the paper asks the following questions. What do we mean when we talk about pluralism or diversity? within Christianity? How does the phenomenon of Christian pluralism relate to the quest for unity to be one community? What can the East African context, which is characterized by proliferation of denomination and other Christian groups, besides other religions like Islam and the Oriental religions, also a multi-ethnic ethnic diversity, which we could call multiculturalism, so what can we learn from the insights gained in the study of world Christianity? It is my conviction that the study of world Christianity can prove to be instructive for interaction in a multi-religious, multi-denominational, and multi-ethnic context. 
So let's explore pluralism and its dynamics. Pluralism is at the core of the Christian tradition, as we have observed. But despite the diversity as well as of what Christianity postulates, there is a fundamental awareness of belonging, a conviction that Christianity is one tradition, one community. But why is Christianity a pluralistic tradition? There are theoretical approaches to respond to this question, and there is also the reality that exists. Several scholars in Africa, like of African of Christianity, like Lamin Sane, Andrew Walls, uh, Kwame Bediaku, and Professor and Mugambi, observed that since it's in its inception, the Christian tradition has opted for an instrumental view of culture. Christianity was not considered to be inextricably or exclusively linked with one particular culture, for example, Jewish. Every culture could potentially be a carrier of the gospel. The communication process, according to Lamy Sane, focused on the recipient and the recipient's culture. Therefore, from the beginning, the Christian message was communicated by using concepts from the recipient culture. Hence, the story of Jesus, which began in a Jewish context, spread to the Greco-Roman world, and especially North Africa, Ethiopia, Persia, China, India, etc. In every culture and age, Christianity adapted itself to its environment. This is the process we call enculturation. And enculturation can be called successful if it transforms the culture as well as the religious tradition involved for example, Christianity and African culture. Christianity is therefore an enculturation movement, something which leads to a plural and diversified Christianity. Christianity has always been plural, a plural tradition. Its diversity has been characterized by theological controversies, political expediency, imperialism, and issues of power, which have led to its fragmentation. History demonstrates that many have succumbed to the temptation to declare their tradition normative and universal. In East Africa, this happened particularly during the colonial missionary era. Attitudes of Western superiority combined with certain provincial worldviews led to the export of Western Christianity to Africa and the rest of the world. This expansion of Christianity from a culturally exclusivist Western world implied cultural uprooting and estrangement for generations of Christians in Africa. And I guess all of us, wherever, elsewhere, sorry. They had to negate themselves and their culture in order to become Christians. There is still an attempt to create the other in the image of the stranger for me. In attempting to understand the other from the perspective, a paradigm shift occurs where no one's perspective or culture form the starting point of understanding and thinking, but rather the, rather the perspective, the culture and context of the other becomes the basis of thinking and understanding. It is important to point out that much has changed, especially due to theologians from all, the, all over the world, advocating change in methodology as well as content of theology. Theology therefore begins from the experience, from experience, human experience, with exploration and analysis of the local context using different lenses, social and uh, like economic, social, gender, anthropological, uh, etc., providing methodologies to analyze the context. Hence, topics like healing, ethnicism, racism, land issues, ecology, conflict resolution, HIV and AIDS and um, the, the latest uh, COVID-19. Topics which had featured in traditional theological agenda have become theological, uh, focal, theological concerns today in Africa. This process has been labeled contextualization and has transformed theological reflection in East Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, and elsewhere. There are many contextual theologies but the most common ones are in Africa, uh, in culturation and liberation theology. So what are the challenges of pluralism? Pluralism carries a 
critical notion that no single tradition can entirely capture the fullness of God. Thus, healthy interaction is necessary. Exchange between the various interpretations can therefore be mutually enriching. Christian dialogue within world Christianity is an imperative in order to forestall the exclusivist claims of certain types of Christianity. Unity and solidarity, nevertheless, does not imply theological consensus or uniformity. It is worth noting that power plays a major role in world Christianity within church structures and within theology. For example, the propagation of gospel, of universal gospel, universal type of theology is an attempt to exercise power. It ignores and suppresses the voice of those who are different. How to deal with the issues of power in a frank and morally upright way is one of the major challenges of world Christianity. That is why dialogue and listening to one another is important. Dialogue enables one to qualify his or her points of view. For example, in the late 1990s, Kibanguism was vilified in, uh, uh, by, by other Christians and other organizations for their formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity. It took a pastoral visit of a team from the World Council of Churches to investigate what exactly was going on. The approach was dialogical and an understanding was arrived at without either party being judgmental or ju judging the other wrongly. We now move to the next question we asked at the beginning, which is the last. What is the relationship between pluralism and unity in world Christianity? I have decided to use Thomas Ryan's model of relational unity to respond to the questions. Uh, to the question, Ryan proposes a model that begins with observation that in a relationship, unity and diversity do not exclude, but rather enable one another. The conviction to belong to one another, according to Lion, La Ryan, and thus there is a joint future. Sorry and that there is a joint future enables space to be different. Therefore, Ryan describes world Christianity in terms of family relationships, the family of God. In a family relationship, people know they belong together. Therefore, they no longer need to act apart. They can be themselves. It is in the closeness of relationship that people argue over insignificant things, but they do this because they feel safe. In world Christianity, according to Ryan, um, pluralism brings about um, being different and interpreting the Christian tradition differently does not change this relationship. Hence, pluralism and the un and unit are not mutually exclusive, but rather complementary. Furthermore, unity facilitates the environment for diversity. The prerequisite for this model is commitment each other. This model resonates with the ecclesiological model of the church as family of God proposed by the first synod of African Catholic bishops in 1994 and which is still in place. Of course, any model based on the family raises a number of questions, but it is nevertheless appropriate for our purposes. What can East Africa learn from world Christianity? Uh, East Africa is, uh, here I'm talking about Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, not Eastern Africa, which comprises uh, other nations that own the East African Union. According to statistics from the national census of each of the countries, Christians make up 82% of the population in Kenya, 85% in Uganda, and about 60% in Tanzania. Each Christian tradition is represented with their different theological positions. During the colonial era, Christianity spread denominationally, and these divisions initially caused confusion and strife. Today, besides the mainland denominations, there are other churches that are uh, independent of any of the global confessions, historical denominations, or Christian churches. These are the African instituted churches and the Pentecost and charismatic churches and ministries. These new churches make up over a quarter of all Christians, especially in Kenya, where there are more of these churches than in Uganda and Tanzania. 
uh, the Pentecost, the Pentecostals don't in include not just the new Pentecostals, but the classical Pentecostals, which have also been growing tremendously. And these two types of Christianity have altered the Christian landscape in East Africa in many ways. There are many varied and variable ecumenical initiatives in East Africa, which Vyaruhanga calls natural and false and structured ecumenism. National Christian councils exist in all these countries, although in Kenya, the Catholic Church is not a member of the National Councils, Council of Churches. But there are also other bodies uh, that exist that bring together African instituted churches, for example, the Organization of African Instituted Churches. And then the Pentecostals, the new Pentecostals have very many associations. Some break and others emerge. But the major one is the uh, uh, Kenya Evangelical Fellowship. The religious prejudice still exists that lead to viewing AICs and the new Pentecostal churches with suspicion. Fears of sheep stealing and teachings of wrong doctrine and interpretation of scripture still persist. But the unwritten policy seems to be live and let live and cooperate when need arises. Aggressive evangelism is also a major challenge, especially among the newer churches. And this breeds hostility between them and the mainline churches and the AICs, which they target for evangelism. The insights from the study of world Christianity uh, that can be appropriated to the diverse East African denominational and world ethnic context is the, is the importance of dialogue, respect for the other, being non judgmental, and the understanding that this is that it is in the nature of Christianity to be diverse. So this calls for the realization that, so, to the realization that the mission and witness belong to the very being of the church and God's invitation to all, is to all in the community to become God's co-workers and participate in God's continuing act of recreating and uniting the whole of creation. The churches are called to engage in God's mission and witness in unity according to the gospel principles. The unity of the church is the essential factor in carrying out God's mission in all contexts. Unity brings to the world the power of the gospel to do what humans cannot do, to, to do what human, humans cannot do alone. The demonstration of unity empowers mission and enables effective Christian witness as divided. Church is the church, church uh, as witness as a divided church is incompetent for its mission. It is in this context that mission in unity is relevant and both needed to be inseparably linked to the relevant theological convictions too. Now, as far as the teaching of ecumenism is concerned, is concerned to say this as I finish. Uh, I agree that, uh, and also what Professor Kwabena has said, and uh, as Paul Mbanda or Vyaruhanga has observed about this context, and something I also observed was I called uh, some institutions, that I sent out. Uh, uh, some few questions to some institutions to ask about uh, the approach in teaching world Christianity and also in teaching humanism. What surprised me is that some institutions, departments of religious studies or theological institutions, some do not even have ecumenism as a course by itself. It is taught within, it is mentioned within uh, church history, especially in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, even African instituted churches and Pentecostal and charismatic church, which have reshaped the religious lands or the Christian lands in the continent and within even East Africa, uh, they are not taught. It's like there is still a denigration or a negative perspective or a lack of understanding of the import of these churches and what they are. Because if we talk of enculturation, it was first, uh, it first occurred within the African instituted church. And there's a lot that mean like, that mean like churches 
the Bosa land and embraced from the new Christ, the new uh, charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity, as well as the older churches, the African instituted churches. So there is need for an overhaul of the curriculum. I also recently uh, evaluated the PhD theological curriculum of one institution in Kenya. There, was in, there were courses on church history, but the, the approach to developing that course and even in teaching that course is still very Eurocentric. So I was surprised also that although ecumenism was there as a course, there was no course at all on African uh, independent churches or the new Pentecostal churches. And mind you, these courses, these courses were designed to be taught in an African institution. So much as we may be aware from this conference, the importance of world Christianity and that there have been shifts and the world is changing, the contours have been changing. This is not the case in our institutions. Uh, some, there are some limitations. In some institutions, I was told that um, they are reviewing their curriculum, they are going to include it. Or they have that course, they have a course on ecumenism uh, in their, uh, you know, in their, in their, in their they, they already have such a course in the curriculum, but there are limitations to the number of four courses or core courses or electives that uh, a department can teach in any one subject. So all the same, there is a, there is a problem in the teaching of the humanism and world Christianity in the African institutions uh, that I talked about. Of course, there are some institutions that, need, that even have a center for world Christianity, but those are very few. They can't even be three or four. And when you look at the composition of the, the faculty in such institutions, you'll find that the initiative came from a scholar who comes from Europe or America, but not from our own uh, scholars themselves. And again, despite also not uh, like Professor Kwabena said, lack of focus on African scholars in the region, in history, in theology, that is also there. And the lack of a change of perspective completely in teaching a world Christianity. Even the word world Christianity does not feature in many institutions. It's only in very, very few institutions. So I think with those few words, uh, uh, I would like to say thank you very much for, the, for listening to me and for the opportunity to participate in this conference. Thank, thank you so much, Professor uh, Waura. This, this, I, I liked very much your, your circle when you, <clears throat> when you started from pluralism and diversity and, and you advanced through the question of inculturation and, and power and, and, and clearly showed to us that belonging to one another is one of the keys to how to overcome the question of power, but at the same time, it's also a solution towards the unity between us when we belong to, we realize that we belong to one another. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, once again, all those questions will be addressed to you after our third speaker, who is uh, Dr. Jude Lal Fernando, assistant professor in the Irish School of Ecumenics, uh, School of Theology, uh, uh, School of Religion, Trinity College, Dublin, and he's also coordinator of, of master program in, in cultural theology and interreligious program. He teaches word Christianity uh, and interreligious dialogue and religions and ethics. Before his arrival in Ireland, he worked as a member of Tulana, which is a center of interreligious dialogue and, and uh, research in Kelania, Sri Lanka. And he got engaged in social movement of justice and peace under the mentorship of Aloysius Pires. Uh, certainly many of you know him, at least by name. And, in, and he got engaged in social movements uh, 
uh, in, 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 in Sri Lanka. He's currently the director of Trinity Center for Post-Conflict Justice and coordinator of the People's Tribunal on, on Sri Lanka. Uh, he has published, uh, for instance, Religion, Conflict and Peace in Sri Lanka, the Politics of Interpretation of Nationhood. Uh, he's the editor of uh, Resistance to Empire and Militarization, Reclaiming the Sacred, and faith in the face of militarization, indigenous, feminist, and indigenous voices. He, he was the coordinator of the People's Tribunal of Sri Lanka and has been living in exile in Ireland for over 50 years now due to opposition to war in Sri Lanka. And he has served as the visiting professor in Sofia and Ritsumeikan University in Japan, Uppsala University in Sweden, Tampere University in Finland, and Chang Jung Christian University in Taiwan. The title of his presentation is Teaching Interreligious Dialogue and Liberation Theology in Asia, Land, Nationhood and, and Geopolitics as Hermeneutical Lenses. Dr. Fernando, we are really eager to, to hear how do you unpack this complicated sounding topic. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Risto. Really appreciate uh, your generous introduction and grateful to all the organizers of this uh, event, which is a very important one in the emerging theological landscape. Uh, let me begin. Uh, doing interreligious dialogue and liberation theology in Asia is not a new topic. It has a particular methodology. What I'm going to reflect on will be based on that methodology, but at the same time, I want to enhance that methodology by identifying some of the serious blind spots in the existing ways in which merging of interreligious dialogue and liberation theology is done, particularly in Asia. Uh, let me first uh, focus on the methodology of liberating theologies of religions, just to have some kind of a review of it, or to, or to in a way, uh, polish our, 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 uh, our memories or understanding of it. Number one, realizing religious truths in an interreligious mode, not as abstract rational categories, but as liberative truths, seen with the eyes of the oppressed and the poor, whose faith is grounded not on metaphysical understanding of ultimate bliss, but on material spirituality. So in this methodology, salvific truths are seen not as abstract truths, but liberative truths seen from the eyes of the oppressed, and then whose faith is grounded on material spirituality. Second, the combination of faith and reason doesn't matter. What matters is the combination of faith and justice, liberation. Therefore, theology is defined not as faith-seeking understanding, but faith that hopes for justice, liberation, that dialogues with the liberative core of the other religious traditions in which we may find commonalities, radical differences, at the same time, complementarities. Finally, in this methodology, to say that every theology is contextual is intellectual honesty, which we all should have. But to say that a theology that does not liberate is no theology, is a political ideological position that forms the costly discipleship, which is liberational. And it is the Christian demand. It is not an option. It is more than intellectual honesty, a liberal academic position. Many can be liberal academics, but there's a specific call to become liberational scholars, theologians, 
activists who take an option. So that is how I present this methodology. Now, as I said, blending dialogue with liberation is not a new topic, but what is going to be my critique here? In liberating theologies of religion, we neither take Christian exclusivism as the norm, nor class, gender, race, heteronormativity, etc., as the natural. But in certain cases like Israel, Palestine, and Sri Lanka, we have consciously or unconsciously taken the state national identity as the given, which has indirectly justified oppression and settler colonialism. One nation who is accepted by default, like Israel and Sri Lanka, and the other is deleted, like Palestine and Tamil Leela. Therefore, there is an inclusion of certain religious traditions and exclusion of some other traditions. At the same time, parallelly, simultaneously, not recognizing certain national liberation struggles that oppose the state, but the grievances of the Palestinians and the Tamils on an individual basis are recognized. So what is my research question? How do we blend dialogue and liberation in settler colonial contexts like Israel, Palestine and Sri Lanka where the states are seen to be God given or Buddha given. Okay. Let me put it this way in concrete terms, because for me, doing theology is not abstract. Humanity is not abstract. We are a network of relationships, concrete. In case of Israel, Palestine, after the Shoah, Jews have been included into dialogue within a Judeo-Christian civilizational talk, and Muslims have been constructed as the other. The modern state of Israel is recognized with full support, but not the Palestinian liberation struggle. In the case of Sri Lanka and Tamil Leela, after formal independence, Buddhist-Christian dialogue has gained momentum with the liberational trust. Because there are liberation theologians in Sri Lanka, like Aloysius Piris, my mentor. In that, Hindus have disappeared unconsciously. The single Buddhist post-colonial state is recognized, not the Tamil Leelam liberation struggle. Tamil Leelam is destroyed with a massive human cost in 2009 according to UN reports, with around 70,000 killed. So how do I enhance the existing methodology? Why acknowledging what has been established my teachers, companions, and friends? I belong to a different generation who have gone in between the Tamils and the Sinhalese, between the Palestinians and the other oppressed communities. Let me outline my proposal here. These states which I mentioned are colonially cowed with their national identities where religions are involved. These are strategic assets. These states are strategic assets in West Asia like Israel and in South Asia like Sri Lanka of the modern Western empire. So as these strategic assets are cowed at states, they are Religions are also newly reconstructed. They go hand in hand. So if the state is the hardware, as Mitri Rahit, the Lutheran theologian from Bethlehem says, the, the particular theology that underpins the state is called the software. So my proposal is, in terms of disciplines, to involve critical historiography or post-colonial deconstruction of these states and national identities which are missing in most of the predominant literature that blend together in religious dialogue and liberation. And it is very much absent in Jewish Christian dialogue in Europe and in the USA. This is needed to overcome colonial epistemologies that condition in religious dialogue as well as liberation. The hermeneutical lenses are land, 
nationhood, geopolitics and empire. As we know, post-colonial critiques are very good at deconstructing, but very weak at reconstructing. So I want to propose the tools of reconstruction, memory of prophecy, or in Buddhist terms, meditation on conscience, as opposed to memory as prison. Okay. Now, let me come to the European scenario after the Shoah and how the churches, particularly the churches in Germany, responded. I quote a member of the Confessing Church in Germany, Hans Joachim Iwan, in 1959. Academic and theological guilt for Auschwitz. Who is going to take this guilt away from us and our theological fathers because they are it started? How can the German people that has initiated the fruitless rebellion against Israel and his God become pure? This is emerging from a total devastating experience which triggered a guilt conscience amongst the, amongst the good, well-meaning Christians in Europe in the face of Nazi atrocities against the Jewish people. But it was a moral response, but the theological and political implications of this moral response, particularly in their support for the state of Israel was ignored. And that, as we know, the state of Israel was built by making thousands of Palestinians displaced. So you could see the politics of exclusion and inclusion in place here. There's uncritical historiography against the Palestinians by which the biblical Israel is directly connected to the present day modern, highly militarized state of Israel. Historiographically, exegetically, that is utterly, utterly flawed, okay? Let me see what happens. Now, Mark Breuman, a Jewish theologian, writes as follows from a Jewish perspective, but at the same time, entering into a very constructive dialogue with the Christians. I quote, this post-Holocaust formulation stood replacement theology on its head. In the place of seeing itself as the successor to the Jewish people and inheritor of the covenant, mainline Protestant Christianity now defined itself negatively in its confession of the sin of anti-Judaism. This penitential project has not led to the obedience to the Lordship of Jesus. However, instead in their preoccupation with correcting historic, historic church anti-Judaism, Christians have compounded the sin by enabling the Jews project of conquest and domination. Thus, the opportunity afforded by the confrontation with the horror of the Nazi genocide to come to face with the consequences of Christian exceptionalism was squandered. Instead, Christian triumphalism has been replaced by Judeo-Christian triumphalism and its language is Zionism. And theologically, biblically, what unfolds then? Let me see the period between 1948 to 1968. I have put it in bold letters. Why 48? That the first Nakba, displacement of so many Palestinians. 1968, the Sixth Day War displaced the other cohort of Palestinians. And it is a, the same period, Catholic Church's Nostra Aetate outlines its new understanding of Jewish faith. Okay? In that, the covenant with Abraham is asserted, but the angels promise to Hagar and Ishmael is deleted. Then the biblical theologians recover the Jewishness of Jesus, particularly after 1967, in Jesus studies in the USA, this is very much evident, but Palestinian identity is not recognized, inclusion and exclusion. Rabbinic roots of Jesus are acknowledged, but not prophetic roots as in Islam, inclusion, exclusion. Muhammad as a prophet is yet to be accepted. 
total exclusion. The Jews are seen as sons of Isaac and the Arabs are descendants of Ishmael. Liberal peace building and veiled colonial epistemology can be found here. There's a wrong reading of history here. Euro-American Christian peace workers see thousand years of history as a frozen one. And it is they who bring these eternal enemies together. So the US can intervene, UK can intervene to bring the Israelis and the Palestinians together in their own terms by portraying, by portraying an eternal enmity between the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac. That is how the empire has hijacked, hijacked the biblical story for exclusion and inclusion, creating a conflict, at the same time, acting as benevolent mediators. Okay, let's move forward. Mitri Raheb goes on further, looking at the story of the Palestinian people. I quote, in fact, the nostalgia for biblical Israel, which is associated subconsciously with the modern state of Israel, has led to the suppression of the Palestinian narrative. In other words, Christian support of the Jewish people has led to support for the Israeli state and therefore indirect repression of the Palestinians. And what is then the history of Palestine? According to Mitri, I quote again, 2000 years after Jesus, we can continue reciting the list of empires that rule Palestine, the Byzantine, the Arabs, the Crusades, the Ayubids, the Ottomans, the British, and last but not least, the Israeli occupation. We have been trained to naively connect Israel today with the Israel of the Bible, instead of connecting it to the above chain of occupying empires. And then what is the message of the Bible then? Being largely an occupied land, liberation from occupation is a central theme throughout history and plays a major role in the Bible. Okay. And let's see what Mark Breuman from a Jewish side says. Christian Zionism is both these forms is heretical and unbiblical because it negates the core of gospel teachings against territoriality and ethnic triumphalism. It is also heretical for Jews because Zionism in its modern incarnation justifies domination, exploitation, and disposition on the basis of race or religion. Okay, I'll fast track and then from Islamic tradition, it is very interesting to see in one of the latest articles that Shadab Rahimtullah wrote in the edited volume, uh, Faith in the Face of the Empire. He says in the Quran, there's no violent takeover of Canaan as it is found in the Joshua's account in the Bible. I quote Shadab's exegetical analysis of the texts in the Quran, referring to the people who come from Egypt to Palestine. Despite extensive attention that the Quran gives to the Israelite prophets, especially Moses, the text is remarkably silent when it comes to the Israelite encounter with the Holy Land. We are basically given two snapshots of that encounter at two different points in Israelite history and the careful analysis of the text's wording shows that at no point does God order the Israelite to attack the indigenous inhabitants. The command is simply one of entry, dukul in Arabic, humbly and respectfully walking into the land in which they seek sanctuary as trusting that God will protect them just as she did in their liberation from Egypt. Interestingly, let me share one thing with you. One is a Lutheran theologian, Mitri Raheb, and the other one is a Jewish theologian, Mark Breuman. They know each other, but both of them have not met and do not know Shada Prahemtullah. Nor does Shada Prahemtullah knows Mitri or Mark Breuman. This is going to be my next struggle in the coming years to bring them together. Okay. 
Let me come to the Sri Lankan case quickly. I'll finish within five minutes, okay? Let's see how there's a process of imperial inclusion and exclusion in the case of Sri Lanka. Distinct regions of the island, particularly the Tamil region in the North and East, were amalgamated into one unitary political structure in 1833 by the British. The geographical singularity as an island was forged into a political singular territory, which was necessary as a military foothold in containing rival imperial powers and powerful uprisings in India. Sri Lanka was called by the British Prime Minister then the most valuable colonial possession on the globe. That's the hardware. What's the software then? The Singhala Buddhists became the chosen people. The colonial officers romanticized the ancient Singhala civilization as one that had reached heights like Greece and Rome. This just a position is then taken to its logical conclusion, a call for British imperial intervention to restore this past glory is made. Tamils were seen as inferior invaders, Sinhalese as racially superior, who own the entire land. Anyola? Let me see. From a European scholarly perspective, the, there is a tendency to approach the Sri Lankan conflict in a liberal pluralistic way. For example, Perish Mitlokyal, a scholar in Buddhist Christian studies, reduces the Sri Lankan conflict to ancient Buddhist Hindu conflict. And in that, totally deletes the colonial carving, racialization, and colonial epistemology of the present state and its religious identity. On the other hand, Aloysius Piris, my mentor and companion, he engages in Buddhist Christian dialogue with a liberational thrust. I'll quote here, Piris. The biblical poor are basically the slave class whose labor is exploited by the leisure class against the mistaken theory the Sinhala and Tamil people are actually enemy nations. We have consistently proposed the alternative thesis that victims of injustice are the exploited class of both Sinhalese and Tamils forming a majority where victimizers are an elite class of individuals racially compressing both Sinhalese and Tamils. Our method, essentially an interreligious one, was a combination of historical study and social analysis ground in sacred scriptures of religions. It looks more progressive than Perry's liberal colonial profiling of the Sri Lankan conflict, but still it lacks a post-colonial critique of the state. Dialogue and liberation are combined by merging religious pluralism with only class analysis, only with class analysis, where is critical historiography or post-colonial critique of the state. We can find the Sri Lankan state here, even in Piris's work, is unconsciously, indirectly, is accepted as a post-colonial single Buddhist state. At, let me see, both in the case of Israel-Palestine and in the case of Sri Lanka, who have paid the price. Faith communities have internalized colonially cowed state structures, racial national identities, which are imperial and geopolitical assets. Have the European Christians paid for the sins of anti-Semitism? No, it is the Palestinians who pay. Zionism, on the other hand, has hijacked Judaism, which can be liberated only by an anti-Zionist position. In the case of Sri Lanka, Singhala Buddhist nationalism is absorbed like Zionism by the Christian colonial guilt of the Christian churches and their theologians. But who are paying the price? The Tamils. Instead of memory as prison, let us take memory as prophecy and meditation on the conscience. Not knowing the other or no need to know the other. This is a very, very important question for me. Do we know empathetically, effectively the Palestinians or the Tamils? As yesterday, Miguel asked, how would the black people see themselves? 
as distinct from the white? Now, these are some of the interrogative questions I would like to pose. How many of Jewish Christian scholars in Europe are conversant in Arabic? And how many Western Buddhist Christian scholars who work on Sri Lankan conflict know single and Tamil? For most of them, they are field trips. I do not mean to say that no one can specialize in another context, but there has to be a very serious methodological approach to do justice to the local context. On the other hand, how many singular Buddhist Christian scholars, theologians in Sri Lanka are not Tamil? No. When we are in a position of power, it is not that we do not know the other, but we do not need to know the other. That is why God became human. Not simply any human being, but a marginalized Palestinian Jew who resisted that the powers that be beyond death and who was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem. Praise be to God. And my conclusion, in order to go into the real experience of those nations, people's struggles, who have been excluded by default, by the neo-colonial configuration of the world. We need to see how they look at faith. I quote a part of a poem written by a Tamil Muslim in 1980s, when one of the best libraries in the Tamil area was burned by the singular nationalist groups. In that, he questions, where is the Buddha here? I quote the poem. The Lord Buddha was shot dead. He lays on the steps of Jaffna Library. But if we hadn't killed him, we wouldn't have been able to kill even a fly in this land. The plainclothes policemen dragged the corpse inside. They covered the Buddha's body with 90,000 books and lit the pie with Sihalo Vada Sutta, which is a Buddhist text. Lord Buddha's body turned into ashes, and so did Dhammapada. Dhammapada is one of the greatest texts in Buddhism. So the Tamil Muslim, the marginalized one, the excluded one, reminds the Buddhist that you cannot kill us had you not killed the Buddha in you first. Okay? And I would not really quote the other one, but let me conclude from a poem from Palestine. Now, Mahmoud Davish is a Palestinian Muslim poet who extensively borrowed images of Jesus' life in writing poetry. In classical Islam, the crucifixion of Jesus is not accepted, but here, for Mahmoud Davish, in the Palestinian context, the doctrinal differences between Christianity and Islam didn't matter. And he penned down this poem, and I'll conclude with this. Jesus Christ, as the nation crucified and risen. They reduced him, denounced him, they deserted him, they left him on the cross and placed him in the tomb. They besieged him between gravestones. He broke you, oh, how they broke you, to make a throne out of your anguish. It was written in 1982. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you wed Mary? Mary here is Israel. Why did you pledge my only tender to the army? Why? It was written in 1989. Shout so that you hear yourself. Shout so that you know that you are still alive. And you know that life is possible on this earth. Invent a hope for words or an area or a mirage to prolong hope and sing for beauty is freedom. I say life defined only as the opposite of death is not life. He wrote this poem at the end of his life, which was a premature death. Thank you.
Professor Jude, thank you so much for, for really challenging us to become liberational uh, and, and opening up a question of what is inclusion and exclusion in a very deep manner. I think each one of us will, 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 will agree with that. Also a question of uh, methodology and, and uh, all the issue of, of memory of prophecy. Uh, wrong reading of, of history and, and so forth. But without further delay, uh, our time is very limited. So now it's a possibility to, to ask questions or comments, give comments on, on these three uh, speakers. And uh, first come, first served is, the, is the, quite simply the order. Please. Hello. Hello. Yes, I. Yes, I'm uh, Professor Ruti Miyamontui. Okay. University of Ilon in Nigeria. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. You have a question or a comment? Yes, I want to appreciate the presenter. But my question is this. I did expect him to relate what he has said to Africa and Nigeria in particular with religious situation we are passing through. Thank you. Okay. Who would like to answer that? Uh, Philomena or Kwapena, Professor Squid? Maybe Professor Kwapena, you could, because I know that your schedule is very tight. Please, maybe you can comment on that question. No, I suspect the uh, question is, thank you. The, I saw the question for, for the last speaker because my, my uh, paper made direct re references to, to the African uh, situation. Um, and the question is, um, has to do with why a particular presentation was not related to Africa. So I, I saw this for the last speaker. So if the last speaker can. Uh... <laughs> okay, shoot, maybe, please. <laughs> Let me clarify the question. I'm sorry. Hello? So, yes. Okay. Maybe you can repeat the question, please, but shortly. Yes, okay. I said I really appreciate the presentation. It's very good. Well, looking at the presentation, and uh, even the man who, uh, one of the presenters that spoke before him now, uh, said he made a reference to Africa. I feel that uh, it is necessary because Nigeria, Africa, many of these countries are developing countries. So there is a need to focus more on them. Okay, so you understand what I'm saying now? Okay, so Philomena or, or Guapena? Question well, related. I'll take, I'll take that as an observation. So um, it's noted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. No comments, no questions. Okay, maybe Ricardo and John are raising his, their hands. Yeah, one restore, uh, one small comment. Uh, even the categories of developing and developed are colonial for me. Okay. Right. Uh, so what is development at the end of the day? And these things have been highly questioned, you know, uh, these days. Uh, so uh, this has to be theologically also uh, rethought. In the 60s and 70s, we were trying to impose the Western model of development on, on Africa and Asia. And, and we see how there's a lot of resistance to the structural uh, uh, issues connected with the global North and the South within which liberation theologies emerge, prophetic uh, voices within the church. Emerge. So I think it's necessary that we also have to rethink about these discourses which are dominant and also theologically respond to it. That's Thank it. you. Uh, A.P. John, please. I had a question for Professor Fernando. Thank you, sir, for your excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to bring the discussion towards the uh, surging pandemic 
and the interreligious dialogue. So my question was something like this. While apocalyptic fear and eschatological longings have risen during this surging pandemic, do you see any scope for ecumenical slash interreligious dialogue to bring hope slash justice slash liberation to the marginalized and vaccine deprived economically poor communities and also counter the growing nationalism, let's say vaccine nationalism and religious fundamentalism? Thank you. Very long question, John. Uh, very briefly, because it has to be a discussion. What I see is uh, the pandemic has made it, made the existing structural issues more visible than ever before and exacerbated, uh, particularly against the poor. For example, the pandemic in a way uh, forces the poor to choose between life and livelihood. Now, those of us who can really have a Zoom conference can choose between life and livelihood, isn't it? But those wretched of the earth cannot do so. I who belong to middle class academic life, okay, it can be in a room doing my job online. So that's one of the things that we have to deeply reflect. That's, that's one thing across the religious ecumenical spectrums. Second one is amidst the pandemic, there has been an unprecedented amount of spontaneity of humanity, outpouring humanity, okay? Amongst the ordinary people, across the religious divisions, okay? Uh, from, from the USA, from Brazil's Manos region, uh, to Kerala, you could see, okay? That this has been unfolding. And so it's, it's there's, there's, I know quite a lot of people have taken this seriously and started uh, a reflection on this, but what is what I just want to you know stop by making one comment simply because that there are external events that that simply uh, disrupt our life doesn't mean that they change our mind and minds and hearts unless we creatively respond to it. I think the role of the church is to seize the moment to creatively respond to it symbolically, theologically, liturgically, and practically. Yes. Thank you. I see three more hands and then that's the limit. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, for, uh, Ricardo, please, Ricardo. Thank you. Greetings to all from Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, my question is in my Latin American context. Uh, we have the biggest Catholic population in the world. 40% of Catholics worldwide are in Latin America. But within Protestant churches in the region, now there is 20% of Protestants, but within that 20% of the population who, who now are Protestants, the big majority are part of Pentecostal and Neo-Pentecostal churches. That's the uh, changing landscape here in Latin America. But when we go to the ecumenical movement, only a minority of Protestants from Latin America are part of the movement, like Presbyterians, Lutherans, Anglicans, because the historic missions now this new movement of Pentecostals and Neo-Pentecostals who are not part of this conference or this movement because theology or because language barrier. Seems to me that the same thing is happening in Africa and in Asia. What we can do to really include and reach out to this big movement of the new Christianity in Africa and Asia and Latin America, talking about Pentecostals and Neo-Pentecostals. 
seems to me that we still dominated in most ecumenical institutions and seminaries and universities by the North and by Europe. How we can really get more voices from the big majority now of Protestants in Latin America who happen to be Pentecostals and Neopentecostals. And end with this, and a minority within a minority, because I'm Presbyterian, and I'm a big, really big minority within the Catholic majority and within the Pentecostal majority in Latin America. And thank you, Ricardo. Let's take immediately uh, uh, Dr. Emma Wildwood, and uh, what is your question or comment, please? Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, ask uh, Corbena, thank you for your paper, uh, the question that I put in the chat, really, because it strikes me that this is the crux of an issue as a, as a historian, um, a, an observer of contemporary religion across the globe. I have no problem uh, calling Christian anyone who identifies as such. And yet... There are moral, ethical questions about how we as Christians or different varieties of Christians act. And so I don't want this to be a discussion about Kimbanguism particularly. Um, but, you know, I was interested that, that Kwabena, you noted the importance of a Trinitarian formulation um, as part of a central part of our Christian faith. Um, and yet we know that many uh, um, African initiated churches, for example, will have a different take on that formulation. And I just wondered if you had any uh, light to shed on um, the kind of issue that has taxed people for a long time and perhaps has been a very kind of, uh, has, has been most problematic because of Western epistemologies. Thank you for your question. I, I, I'm, af I'm afraid, uh, <laughs> Professor Guabena has left us, so... Uh, I haven't left, I'm here. Oh, no, oh okay. Oh, sorry. Please. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, you want me to respond now? Um, I think I'll just attempt to respond to the, the two questions very quickly. The first one about Pentecostalism and ecumenism. I, I think the problem cannot be laid on any one particular um, door, uh, any, any, any one particular person's feet. The point is that right from the beginning, um, Pentecostals have been suspicious of existing Christian traditions. In fact, they would normally define themselves as a corrective to what has gone before. And then um, those who have the history on their side, historic mission denominations, will also see some aspect of Pentecostalism as an aberration of Christianity. And therefore, I think that uh, both sides have to see in each other um, some gift that God is giving the world and begin to talk to each other. Uh, so it's not the fault of any one particular tradition. Uh, both traditions, broadly speaking, have been suspicious of each other. I, I usually um, like to use the story of the workers uh, who were invited to work um, in Matthew chapter 20. Some were called in the morning, some were called mid-morning, afternoon and evening. And um, if you look at what those who came early said when the, those who came late were being paid, they said, we have borne the heat of the day. But you can't tell the vineyard owner how to use his resources. In other words, you can't tell God how to use his grace. So those who have come last, Pentecostals and, and Charismatics, must know that some people have borne the heat of the day. And those who came early must also know that God is doing new things all the time. The responsibility is ours to talk to each other. So I think the blame game must stop so that we don't have majority and minority. We have God's kingdom made up of people from all denominations, ethnic groups, just as we had at Pentecost. So we have a response to talk to each other. Um, as for the Trinitarian formula and Kimbanguism and so on, 
we have wrestled with theological issues from the beginning. The reason why we continue to refer to Augustine, Tertullian, Western theology, Eastern theology, is because there are many things on which we are not agreed. If you take just the issue of the Holy Spirit, the way one particular denomination will understand it has always been different from the way another denomination will understand it. And we continue to rest, wrestle with the issues. Paul says that, um, we continue to see through a film darkly. The point, though, is that um, those of us with tradition, history, and theology on our side must begin to ask ourselves, what do we find in African-initiated Christianity that we can learn from? Even the fact that we refer to them as African initiated Christianity is problematic because when movements started emphasizing the spirit, we call them Pentecostal. When um, Pentecostal movements started emerging within historic mission denomination, we call them charismatic. When in the West, churches started putting emphasis on the Bible, holiness, we call them evangelical. All these designations have some theological, ecclesiological connotations. Why do we call others African independent? Why did we name uh, a church, Kimbanguism, after the name of its leader? For example, why didn't we call Pentecostalism Seymourism? Because it was started by William Seymour from American, uh, but we call it Pentecostalism. So I think that's where the problem is. Um, whether we are speaking from a Western perspective or African perspective, we can have theological problems that we need to deal with. Because if you take Africa, is, is a designation of a continent. If you take independent or initiated, it simply means that these are churches not of Western origin. As for church, anybody can claim it. So what is the theological definition? or ecclesiological definition of an African independent church beyond Kim, uh, Kimbanguism and Harrisism. You know, so um, the, Emma, these are very difficult issues on which uh, we must uh, continue to dialogue and discuss so that we don't marginalize those who came late. And then those who came late don't see those who come early um, as, as uh, people who have nothing to offer. So that's, that's what I would say to your question. It's a, it's a long answer to a, a simple question, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, now it's time to really to give a great, great thanks to all of our excellent free speakers, keynote speakers. Thank you for all the participation, for the contributions, for the questions. And uh, uh, I, I'm just asked to remind you that uh, in some maybe yeah, 20 minutes from now, there will be also those short paper presentations. So please, where, where you are registered, please follow the, follow the sessions number one, two or three, those, those three slots in, in 20 minutes in this same uh, link. So please don't, don't deep branch yourself uh, out. Just, just hang on. Thank you and uh, have a good break.